All right, it's OTB in NYC, and we are here on the roof of Fitzpatrick's Hotel in Manhattan. It's a pretty sweet venue. It's a pretty sweet view, as you can uh, see myself and owner here uh, with JBL, John Layfield. Bradshaw, you're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's also freezing cold. It is freezing. Yes. Um, I did wonder from the start, because I've given you your three uh, uh, introductions there, and I wondered, when you meet strangers, <laughs> What do you say your name is, and what do you tell what do you tell them? Uh, I usually you are? just I usually just say John. People that have known me for a long time call me Bradshaw, and people that have known my character the last say ten years call me JBL. So I I answered all of those. How Kid, kids in Bermuda that I coach usually call me Coach JBL. So <laughs> there's that, another one. That's right. <laughs> How much of that character is tied up in your personality and who you are and what you're doing even even now? The Bradshaw character was pretty much me. That was a lot of fun. With Ron Simmons, Ron Simmons was my best friend. Ron Simmons, uh, who's uh, Farouk, Russell S. Farouk, uh, first black heavyweight champion. Ron played a lot of football, uh, was a Heisman Trophy runner-up in, in college, a three-time All-American, one of the greats of, of all time in college football at Florida State. Ron and I were really good friends. We loved to sit around and drink beer and have fun. And Vince McMahon saw us one night, it was actually in Baltimore, just sitting around drinking and telling stories. And he told me the next day, he said, I want to put that on television. And I said, do you want us to drink beer and tell stories on television? He said, pretty much yes. He goes, I want you to be you. And he said, I'm going to create this thing called the APA, the Acolyte Protection Agency. And that's how the whole thing was founded. It was because it was me and Ron. And we had a blast doing it. Yeah. And like in terms of the, the various characters that you played, like looking back at some of your career today, there was a dark, like a darker character to begin with almost? That's right. Well, they started us off as uh, Acolytes is almost a demonic character. We were that for a while with The Undertaker as a Ministry of Darkness. That definitely was not us, <laughs> but uh, it was a great, it was a fun character. It was fun to play that character. JBL was a complete different character. He was uh, a guy I knew growing up, uh, and I don't say one person, but a lot of people. There was a lot of oil money in West Texas where I grew up. These guys would drive around in DeLoreans back when that the car was still made and Lamborghinis and throw money in people's face. I absolutely hated those guys. And so when I needed a character to be a bad guy, that's the inspiration I drew from was those guys that I grew up hating because I thought if I hate them so bad, then surely that's the character that'll be a bad guy. Did you ever have any difficulties with that? Because I guess to a certain extent, some people when they're quite young and they're quite a young fan base of WWF and WWE actually believe that this thing is real. But also those people who know what the story is with wrestling kind of think this is who this person is outside of the ring. Do you ever have any difficulties oh, with that? All the time. I, and I still get it all the time. The people that think I'm JBL, that people that think I'm that character that is this uh, rich uh, uber uh, conservative guy who hates everybody, who's xenophobic, who's ever phobic you can have. So I, when I wrestled Eddie Guerrero, who was a good friend of mine, I did the, the, the eulogy at Eddie's funeral. Eddie was a, a one of the grooms one at my wedding, one of my best friends. I would walk around New York when I lived here and I would see Hispanic crews and you could hear them cussing me in Spanish because they would say, that's that guy who was fighting Eddie, Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. It was, I was hated. I get, get called all kinds of names walking through airports. I, I thought it was awesome. I was doing my you job. Enjoyed it, really. Yeah. yeah, you know that Eugene from The Walking Dead. He had to get off social media because people gave him so many death threats and harassment. You know, people still. I don't think anybody believes Walking Dead is real, but they, they want to hate that character. And I was the character that they wanted to hate, and, and I'm, I was glad of that because I was doing my job. It sounds like you had a lot of influence on JBL as a character because obviously there's a huge writing team in the WWE, but you must have been driving a lot of that yourself. A lot of it was myself, yeah. And Vince McMahon had an idea for it as well. I, I, I drew a lot of inspiration off people that I saw growing up and also Jerry Ewing from the old uh, TV show Dallas. Vince never saw it as that Jerry Ewing, Ewing character because I've heard him being asked that in interviews, but I did. And that's where I drew a lot of it from. But a lot of the, the characters came, especially in the beginning, from uh, three people, from Vince McMahon, myself, and Eddie Guerrero. Eddie loved my character, and it, Eddie wrote a lot of my character himself because he enjoyed it so much. Really, right? And I wonder, um, you know, just in terms of the, some of the aspects you've mentioned, that uh, the abuse that you would you would get for those things, like were there things that you had to do over your period there that you were being asked to do that you weren't necessarily happy with? Are you actually sort of you know willing enough to... to Owen talks about the, the lines, obviously, the, no. the writers I, that went with it. I knew it was a, an acting. You know, I, I knew it was. I, I knew who I am, and uh, my friends did too. You know, I was a bad guy on TV, and I knew it was fake. I knew it was part of the business. Uh, people didn't see that. People didn't see the difference. I can't handle that. That, yeah. that meant I was doing my job well. 
I had to have security extra t at times. What? When uh, Eddie's uh, mother, 70 something years old, had a heart attack, which was all fake and fixed and written in a script in El Paso on Mother's Day, I almost got killed. I had, actually had to have a police escort take me out of town. They were scared of me to stay the night in El Paso that night. Wow. And I had to have extra security every place I'd go when I was wrestling Eddie in the Southwest because it was a huge Hispanic population. Yeah, like you, so the, the skit there was you went down to the border and you were trying to hunt out guys who were trying to come across. And, but um, you pissing off an entire nation of, <laughs> uh, of a nation that are like wrestling crazy. Uh, seems like, uh, I don't know if that's the best career move. <laughs> it's maybe not, but we, I tell you what, was, the reason that came about with Eddie's mother was because I was supposed to face Eddie at the Staples Center coming up, and it wasn't a loaded card. You had a lot of guys that were injured, and so they were scared we weren't going to be able to sell tickets. And JBL was a new character. i just gone from Bradshaw to JBL. They are really worried that this main event could carry the show. And so we did that angle with uh, Eddie's mother, uh, which was created by Eddie Guerrero and his brother Chavo, by the way. Right. And we got to Staples Center. It looked like it was 90% Hispanic. They all were there to see me die. And we set an attendance record that held for a number of years that night. But it was all because of uh, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, the, the move from one character to another, so there's the darker side that we mentioned, and then maybe a bit more of a mellow character after that before it moves into the maybe more of a businessman. Is that fair enough? Is that the sort of trajectory? Absolutely. And, and part of it was legit. You know, part of any character is legit. You know, we're not Al Pacino or Rob uh, De Niro. We're, we're not legendary actors so we had to draw something from ourselves or at least I do and some, some of these guys may, may be Pacino and De Niro I certainly wasn't Bradshaw was pretty much me I enjoyed drinking beer with Ron Simmons JBL was a character that I knew growing up that I hated but it also had some truth sprinkled in it I was working on Wall Street at the time I was doing uh, financial television and I was living in New York so part of this was true I mean, part of this background of this was true and that, that helped blur the line between what people see on television and is this real, is this not real. You know, it's the old thing, Stephanie McMahon is Vince McMahon's daughter. In real life, she's also his daughter on television. But that, that blurs the line and makes it more entertaining for people. To what extent when you go into commentary with WWE, is that real? Are you a character as well when you've got the mic? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I say 100%. You know, I call the action, I say that this is what it is, that's true. Is this how what, what, what hurts, that's true. Uh, but a lot of the character is just, it's, it's a character. I'm a bad guy. I'm a bad guy, I say bad things. People sometimes hate that because, heaven forbid, you hate the bad guy. I hate for that to happen. So, some of the stuff that, like, some of the stuff you talk about in 2018 probably wouldn't, you probably wouldn't get away with a lot of things. Couldn't do it now. Yeah. Couldn't do a lot of it now. We did a lot of stuff that was really pushing the envelope uh, with Eddie. And Eddie, Eddie came up with a lot of it. Eddie came up with the line, my ancestors come over here in a boat, not an inner tube. Right. Uh, Eddie gave me that line one day and he goes, say this, say this, say this. I go, Eddie, I'm gonna die for saying this stuff. He thought it was great. So you say you couldn't get away with that sort of stuff in 2018. Does Vince McMahon also hold that opinion? Yeah, I, I, it's the nature of television now. You know, they're, they're a, a PG rated show. And they've done that for very good reasons. You know, we didn't have the sponsors they have now. They're making a lot more money than we made, but because they went to a PG rated show. You know, the Attitude Era, which was worse than uh, my era as far as really pushing the envelope, you couldn't do that now and get the sponsors that they have. I wonder, um, it strikes me, I wouldn't say this is a, a, an opinion that's widely held necessarily, but it does strike me that there are a lot of comparisons between the UFC, what they're doing, and what WWE and WWF uh, have been doing as well. I wonder, just interested to get your, your take on that, like there's a, quite an amount of obviously hype that's involved in, in uh, putting those shows together. Yeah, and I don't think it's uh, just UFC, you know, boxing started that with Muhammad Ali, you know, he got it from Gorgeous George and he gave him credit for that. He was in. Uh, of Vegas and Gorgeous George wrestling Freddie Blassie and they sold out the convention center and Muhammad Ali, I think it was his eight pro fight, sold about 800 tickets. And that's where Ali came up with the idea after talking to George, why, why are you selling so many more tickets than me? George told him, says, because you don't create any interest. And George outlined the entire thing for Muhammad Ali as far as being the greatest, being the prettiest. And that's when Ali realized how valuable promotion was in boxing. A lot of people tried to copy Ali. They weren't very good at it. He was obviously the best. Conor McGregor is the new Muhammad Ali. The guy is just fantastic. It helps that he's also one of the best fighters in the world and in the history of the UFC. So there is a lot of comparisons there. It's a lot of hype. The problem is when you have too much hype and people see through it, it, it can be very, it can be counterproductive. Yeah. What do you think? Where do you think Conor McGregor stands on that line at the minute? 
Oh, I think he's fantastic. I, I love what he does. I, mean, I absolutely, I th it's just entertaining as it can be. Because it, it's, it comes across, and I'm sure a lot of it's hype, but it comes across as real. And when you see it, if you love him, you love him more. If you hate him, you hate him more. It, it's perfect. Everybody has an opinion on Conor McGregor, just like everybody has an opinion on John Cena. Yeah. It, like, it's, in, it's interesting, actually, because we just had the conversation about some of the stuff you were doing that maybe you don't get away with in 2018. And he's doing a lot of... He's saying a lot of edgy things, and he's doing. He's a lot going of a lot things. further than JBL ever did, <laughs> <laughs> and he's making a lot more money than JBL ever did. Good for him. I mean, who who else could get this fight with uh, Floyd Mayweather? And he, I thought he did a fantastic job, by the way. I mean, a guy who never fought before in boxing in, in a professional level takes uh, Floyd Mayweather that deep into the fight. That was just a phenomenal performance. Putting your business hat on for a moment, if you were in Dana White's shoes and you see McGregor getting to a point where he's almost bigger than the UFC and Ronda Rousey leaving for the WWE, would he be a little bit worried and how would you fix that? I think he's a little worried about Conor because obviously you can't control him. I don't, I don't want to speak for Dana. I certainly don't know his mind. I've met Dana many times soon. He's done a wonderful job with UFC. But a guy like that, you always worry about because he's got so much power. But I don't know where else he can make the money. I mean, he's making a couple hundred million dollars for the fight with Mayweather. He can't make that anywhere else except pay for you fighting. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if he can make that with WWE. I would, I would not think that he could. Uh, he would be a great WWE character, by the way, though. Does it reflect poorly on the integrity of the UFC and the fact that it's real fighting as opposed to the WWE that Ronda Rousey would leave the UFC for WWE? I don't think so. You know, I th we had Ken Shamrock. Uh, who came over, who was UFC champion, who was the baddest man on the planet, and he was. He was as close to an animal as anything I've ever seen. I, I love Ken, but he was a dangerous human being and loved to fight and a great fighter. And he came and made a lot of money in the WWE and probably would have been a world champion for a long time if he had chose to stay with WWE. Ken wanted to go back to fighting. I, I wish he'd have stayed because I think he'd been a great WWE character for, for many years. Dan Severn came over, Brock Lesnar came over. It's entertainment, you know. I don't think it diminishes uh, UFC if they come over and do WWE. I, you know, they they hold their own in UFC based upon merit, and Ronda Rousey has earned her spot based on merit. Is there a danger, almost in some respects, just on that point about Conor McGregor and the enormity of his brand at the minute, almost versus the UFC? He thinks he's bigger than the UFC. He may be. <laughs> I don't know. He may be. I don't think he is, but he certainly he he's the biggest draw in probably in fighting today. I mean, unless Brock Lesnar comes back, wins a heavyweight fight and fights for the championship, I don't know anybody else that could draw like Conor McGregor could, can right now in the world and, and probably in the history uh, of fighting, you know, because of the numbers now. The numbers are so much bigger now. Uh, it's interesting talking about Dana White. He's obviously a pretty active and very successful businessman. I wonder in the context of some of those other points that Owen made about, you know, the Ronda Rousey crossover, is Dana White maybe conversely looking at possible ways that he could pivot UFC as well to try and hoover up some of that uh, some of that money? Hoover up some of that money from UFC? Uh, outside of UFC, is he looking at, you know, there are some of the other sports, I know that WWE has looked at other alternatives across other sports. Is there an area that you would be able to identify that you think that uh, UFC might be able to pivot Not knowing into? Dana, I would not know. I mean, but knowing as, as well as Dana has built UFC, uh, he would be a boost in anywhere he went. I, I just think the world of what Dana Watt has done, I think he's done a tremendous job. Talk to us about uh, rugby, John. That's the thing we're most interested to get your views on. It's uh, by all accounts, we have been just been chatting before we came on air here about the opportunity that exists with rugby in the US at the minute. And you are of the belief that it is massive. I think that the biggest growth opportunity in global sports is professional rugby in the United States. And I think it's going to happen. I'm, I'm part of the ownership structure of uh, Rugby United New York which is a, a team that will be playing in the Major League Rugby. Uh, we won't be playing the, in the inaugural season, we'll be playing next season. We paid our rights fees, our capital calls, so we're part of the league, but we chose not. To, we chose to be better prepared and going in the second season. Um, professional rugby is going to make it in the United States. There's not a doubt in my mind. It's too big globally. It's too much of an American-based sport. I mean, it's, it's, it's made for America. Americans love big tough guys that, that play a big tough game and, and the ethos of it I think is something that people are going to embrace. It's what people love about rugby worldwide is the integrity of the sport. 
hopefully it's us that, that make it. Uh, if not, somebody will. Uh, hopefully, uh, for me, it, it's us. It's an interesting one, isn't it? It's almost a, a conflict that you want rugby to be as successful as possible for the United States, but you also want your franchise to be better than the rest of the other franchises. So there's a little bit of a conflict there, I guess. Well, I want, I want us to make it too. You know, I, if, if the league makes it, I think we'll make it. We're obviously, I think the, the I hate to say this with the other teams, but I think New York's the crown jewel of, of, of any league uh, in, in the United States, and I think. Hopefully, will be the crown jewel of, of, of this league. And yes, I want it to be successful. I want the other teams to be solid. We met with a potential team owner tonight, uh, today, uh, that could come in, in in 2020, and we want solid owners. Uh, but still, that being said, you're right. We want to be the best. Yeah, it's, it's, we we want to win. We, we're we're playing Boston coming up, and uh, we want to win, but we don't want to win 70 to nothing. And no offense to, to Boston uh, by, by saying that, but. I, we don't want to lose 70 to nothing either, but I wouldn't mind losing, but we want games close. For sure. And the other thing as well is when you mentioned the growth opportunity, you look at something like the MLS and football being such a huge global sport, whereas with rugby you don't have that. So I guess that adds credence to your belief that it is the biggest growth potential in the world because you've got a sport there that's willing to grow and not just the league. That's right. And you can build it from the foundations up. You know, rugby worldwide is a, is a phenomenon. You know, look at the World Cup. Uh, drew more viewers than the Super Bowl did. Uh, so there's a huge following globally, and there's a lot of following in pockets in the United States, not a, pervasively across the United States. But MLS has done a wonderful job uh, building up football. The same founders of MLS are the ones building Major League Rugby as well. It's been tried here before, obviously. What are, I'm sure you've looked at those models and studied it. What are you going to do differently? The main thing we're doing different, uh, I know Doug Schoeninger uh, uh, pretty well. Uh, I like Doug. Uh, uh, Doug's like one of these guys like Connor or John Cena that uh, I think you have one free point or, or the other about Doug. I've had, some, I've had a good meeting with Doug uh, in the past. I think the mistake that Doug Schoeninger made with Pro Rugby was the fact that it was a one uh, person owned the entire league. So like in New York, we're doing all kinds of things. We've got the, the fire department playing, the police department right before our first big game. We've got all kinds of things we're doing locally in the city. You can't do that if you don't have a local ownership structure. So what, we're, what Major League Rugby is doing is every uh, team has a local ownership structure. And these, these owners have been well vetted. And I think that's the major difference to me between the pro rugby league that Doug Schoeninger started and what Major League Rugby is doing. What represents success when you get this thing up and running in terms of the MLR, in terms of the Eagles? So it's, what's the end goal here? What's success for you guys? I think you'd measure in equity valuations. You know, that's how they measure MLS. You know, it goes from a couple million to 200 million in 20 something years. Uh, that's not our goal. Our goal is to make a little money off of it, but to have a, something that we do that's pretty cool. We want to do good stuff in New York City. I know that sounds altruistic, but that's actually what we want to do. We want to work with Play Rugby USA and use the team here in New York to, to bring rugby to more inner city schools, help with graduation rates, and actually use rugby as a tool to help New York. We want to be a true New York sport. We spoke last night, we were in the pick-up list, we were uh, live off the ball broadcast from there, and one of the things that stood out was your emphasis on the idea that you don't need much actually to play this game. It isn't like American football, you really just need a ball and some, some space to get at it. And, and New York is such a diverse city, it could actually, uh, and, and America is such a diverse country, it could actually, uh, that could play into its favor almost. Sure it is. <clears throat> and one thing that was uh, <clears throat> so big about basketball in the inner cities, <clears throat> and why kids are so good, is because all you need is a ball and a goal. So every kid gets to play basketball in the inner city. So you have this huge grassroots foundation of players that are coming up. Same with stickball years ago in the United States where the baseball got so big was because every kid in America was playing because it's so cheap. American football, you need 22 players and a lot of equipment. Rugby, you need a ball. It's much like soccer or football, depending on where you're from, what you call it. You, you just need a ball, and it's easy to understand. You, you, you got a ball, you got to pass it backwards, you get it across the goal. Football, soccer, you, you got to ball, you've got to get it in a goal. You know, it's very simple to understand and very easy to use for inner city kids. I, I've done a lot with inner city at-risk kids all over the world. I just got back from India, going through the slums of Mumbai, dealing with a lot of the football and rugby programs about how they work with kids. Kids are drawn to it because of the simplicity of it and the fact that it gives them an outlet to do something and they don't have that outlet.
are there plans to get involved with the university system? Because obviously if you want to compete with the likes of basketball and American football, you're going to have to be at that level as well in terms of offering scholarships and the likes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the university system is actually decent in the United States right now, mainly in the Northeast. There are a lot of other schools that play. Most of those players, when they get done, they were just done. They don't play anymore because there's nowhere for them to go. They now have an option to go play something else. So there's actually a lot bigger player pool in the United States than what people realize it because a lot of these players just never go anywhere else to play in clubs after college. Thanks, John, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, William, for joining us. It's cold out here as well. People probably don't fully appreciate that, so uh, thanks, William, for taking the time. Freezing really cold. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. That's it from uh, OTB and NYC.